to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the bible says that the disciples came together on the first day of the week to break bread acts chapter 20 verse number 7. we welcome you today to our study of worshiping god through the actions of partaking the lord's supper and giving we're so glad that you've joined us today as always we encourage you to visit the lord's church in your area these lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ and the Church of Christ in your area. would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Uh, if there's something you've been wondering about, a Bible question, or maybe you'd like to have a home Bible study, they'd love for you to let them know. If you'd just like to visit their services, they'd be more than happy to have you as a guest or a visitor to any of their Bible study or worship services. Friend, we're so glad especially that you've joined us for our program. And if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, we'd be happy to make that available to you free of charge. Visit our website, The Gospel of Christ, or you can contact us through the information given during our broadcast today. Today we're thinking about two various aspects of ways that we worship God, and especially as we worship God corporately, together with God's people, and through the action of giving as well. And those ways are through taking the Lord's Supper and through the action of giving. And so we're going to focus on what the Bible says on these subjects. What do we know on the subject of the Lord's Supper especially. We know that Jesus instituted it in Matthew 26, verses 26 through 28. Jesus, as at that Last Supper with His disciples, He took that through the vine, He took that unleavened bread, this is my blood, this is my body, and here's what He said to them, Do this in remembrance of Me. We know that Christians in the New Testament did partake of the Lord's Supper, for as we noted in Acts 20 verse 7, the disciples came together on the first day of the week for that purpose, to break bread. And so we want to learn what we can about the Lord's Supper so that when we partake of it, we do it in a way that brings honor and glory and really worships God. What do we know about the Lord's Supper? A premier text that deals with the Lord's Supper is found in your Bible in 1 Corinthians 11. If you don't have your Bible, we want to encourage you to locate that and have it handy as we're going to study this text together today. Notice 1 Corinthians 11 in verses 20 through 22, we learn that to worship God correctly, through the Lord's Supper, there has to be an attitude of reverence involved. Notice 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse number 20. Paul says, Therefore, when you come together in one place, Paul is condemning them because they're not eating the Lord's Supper. It's not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. One's hungry, another's drunk. Paul says, what, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? Paul says, what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. Now, there were problems in Corinth, and Paul's dealing with this. When partaking the Lord's Supper, some got there early, evidently. Some got there a little later. And instead of waiting on everybody and doing it together as the body of Christ, others are jumping ahead, and you've got chaos. And so Paul says, this is not something we can say is good. There ought to be an attitude of reverence. We ought to do it to worship God. I don't show up to get my supper. That's not the idea. I'm not going to get there before others so I can get a little ahead of That's not the idea or the mentality. We partake of the Lord's Supper. We do it with an attitude of reverence to worship God. John 4, 24. God's a spirit. Those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. We remember the Lord's Supper to exalt the death, the burial, and the resurrection and to honor Jesus Christ. That's why we partake the Lord's Supper with an attitude of reverence. I want to honor and pay tribute to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. I want, to, I want to remember what Jesus did on the cross for me. He Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree. And so there is a, a sense of reverence for God. But there's also a sense of respect for others as well. In the first century, it must have been a scene of chaos. Some getting there early, some getting there in the middle, some getting there late. Everybody's taking it ahead of everybody. There's no cohesion. There's no communion. That's not the idea. It's just chaos. And friend, out of respect for others, we want to do it together. We want to do it in a manner that will promote people growing closer to God and respect for one another and honoring everybody in a situation like unto that. But then I want you to notice, not only do we have to have the attitude of, of reverence and respect, but there are certain definite requirements when it comes to the Lord's Supper. Notice 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 through 25 in your Bible. Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. In principle, there are requirements that God has set. And the principle is simply, God has always wanted us to do what He said, right? 1 Corinthians 4, 6, we're very clearly told in the Bible not to go beyond what's written. 2 John 9, some transgressed by going beyond the teaching of Christ. We're not to add to nor take away. Revelation 22, 18 and 19. And friend, to those who didn't follow what God said, there was always a horrible tragedy in Scripture. You think about King Saul. He rebelled against God. He did not obey God's commands. God removed him as king. But not just in the principle are there certain requirements, but in practice as well, there are certain requirements. Let me illustrate. Jesus, he took bread. He broke it. Gave thanks in Matthew 26, and each of them partook that in remembrance of His body, which was given for them. Is there, a, is there something we need to do as it relates to the Lord's Supper? Sure. As I take the bread, I need to think about the body of Jesus that was shed on the cross for me. Jesus, He took the cup, the fruit of the vine. He gave it to each of them. They divided uh, among themselves. They each drank of the contents, the fruit of the vine. And Jesus said, This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. When I partake of the fruit of the vine, I need to remember the blood of Jesus that was shed. And so, in practice, there are definite requirements. There, there needs to be the unleavened bread, and there needs to be fruit of the vine. Uh, those are the contents of it. And in doing that, we need to remember how Jesus gave up His life for us. Think about what Jesus suffered, how He was beaten, how He was spit upon, how He was mocked, how uh, He was beat with whips, how, how the crown of thorns was placed on His head, how His hands and feet were nailed to a cruel cross, how that sword pierced His side, and how His body suffered for me. I need to think about His blood, which flowed down from Calvary. I need to think about that blood, that, that saves man's soul, the sacrifice, how we contact that and the sacrifice that Jesus made for each and every one of us. And so when you think about the Lord's Supper, there are some definite requirements that we must meet and partake in to really give God the glory and the honor. But then I want you to notice there's a sense of, of regularity to the Lord's Supper as well. Notice 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 26. Paul says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. How often, how often did they, in the, New, in the New Testament, in the first century, how often did Christians partake of the Lord's Supper? Well, here's, here's what we find in our world today. We'll find some in our world today who might take it on Christmas and Easter. We'll find some who do it once a year, some who do it monthly, some who do it quarterly. Well, how often did Christians in the New Testament, 
partake of the Lord's Supper. The Bible says in Acts 20 verse 7, the disciples came together on the first day of the week to break bread. What was the oftenness? 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26, as often as you eat, how often did New Testament Christians partake of the Lord's Supper? They came together on the first day of the week. Friend, there's no specific week in mind. Every week has a first day, and thus you see the regularity every first day of the week. Let, let me illustrate it to you this way. Remember, first Acts 20, verse 7, the purpose for the coming together was to break bread. How often did they come together? 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2, they came together, they were commanded when they came together to give every first day of the week. And so they were meeting every first day of the week. The purpose for that meeting, along with other items as well, one of those was to break bread. And so if they're meeting every first day of the week, part of the purpose of that is to break bread. And friend, we ought to do as they did in the New, Te in the New Testament. Take of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. Every week has a first day, no specific week in mind. Uh, let me give you an illustration, another illustration. It comes from the Old Testament, but it helps us to understand it. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, God said to Israel, Remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. Now what was the Sabbath? Well, the Sabbath was Saturday, right? When God said, Remember the Sabbath, what did that mean? Did it mean one Saturday a year? Did it mean Passover Saturday? Did it mean two Saturdays? Was it quarterly? The Jews interpreted that correctly by remembering every Sabbath that rolled around. The Bible says on the first day of the week, Christians came together. Christians today ought to remember the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. When we gather together as God's people on the first day of the week to worship and honor Him as we're commanded, we ought to with regularity. Remember the Lord's Supper. Well, what exactly am I to remember as I worship God in partaking the Lord's Supper? Notice 1 Corinthians 11, verse 24 through 26. The Bible says, Jesus speaking, or Paul speaking, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. How, how are we to remember the Lord's Supper? Well, here's how. Jesus said, When you take this bread, remember my body, which was broken for you. Think about all that Jesus suffered. How they beat him, how they slapped him, how they placed that crown of thorns on his head. You know, the, the Lord's Supper is a time to reflect. It's a time to remember what the Lord did for you, how much he gave up for you, how much physical pain and torment and anguish he had to go through. And then it's a time to reflect on his sacrifice, the blood of Jesus, from the moment they first began to inflict pain on him to when they brought that, that whip across his back to when those thorns embedded into his brow, to when the, the, the nails went through his hands and his feet, the side he was pierced, his, uh, the sword pierced Jesus' side, and the blood that flowed. The blood represents the sacrifice of Jesus. During the Lord's Supper, I have an opportunity to remember, to be motivated by how much Jesus suffered for me, how great his sacrifice is, and, and what an awesome privilege to remember that and to remind myself just how important that is to my Christian walk. And then, of course, as we mentioned, it's also a time for inner reflection. The Lord's Supper ought to cause me to look inwardly to my own life and make sure that I'm living the way God wants me to. Notice in your Bible, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 through 29. The Scripture says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. I want to reflect on, on the manner. Why am I doing this? Why am I partaking the Lord's Supper? Am I doing it so everybody can see me? Am I doing it to get my ticket punched? Am I doing it to get my uh, bread and grape juice cocktail? What's the reason? that I'm doing that? Am I doing it to really honor God? I want to reflect on myself. 
I want to make sure my life is like it needs to be. Now, friend, please understand, we all realize that we sin, that we fall short, that we do things that we shouldn't, but I want to make sure that I'm, I'm trying to walk in the light, that I ask God for forgiveness, that my heart's where it needs to be, that I know I'm not perfect, but I'm trying to do my best to serve God. Uh, the Bible says it in another way. In 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, Examine yourself, test yourself, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. And then, of course, I want to reflect on all that the Lord Jesus Christ has done for me and how much He's given up so that I could have the hope of eternal life. And so the next time you think about the Lord's Supper and as we think about worshiping God this way, remember this is something Jesus instituted. Remember it's something that New Testament Christians did every week. And remember, there's a certain way that we ought to do that in reflection of what Jesus did, looking to ourselves, trying to live right, and trying to bring God the glory and honor in everything that we say and do. Now, in this lesson also, we want to focus on another aspect, uh, another way that we can bring honor and glory to God, and sometimes in a corporate way, way as well, is through our giving to God. Now, let me preface it by saying this. Friend, we're not asking you today for money. That's not our purpose. This is not a, a session where we're going to beg you for money. We're going to say send in a love offering. We're going to, no, that's not what this is about. When we talk about giving as an act of worship, we're talking about the individual Christian giving to the local congregation that he or she is at to honor and to reach the loss and to honor and to worship God. And that's something that the Bible teaches that Christians ought to do to bring honor and glory to God. We're to give as we've purposed in our heart. And so think about some passages today that teach us on the subject of giving. God, God doesn't want the leftovers. God wants me to give the best that I have. Giving is something that every Christian ought to do every first day of the week. Now we're not talking about the amount. Uh, no, no one should ever come over and ask you how much you're giving. Nobody should ever ask you to give us. That's not the, your giving is between you and God. But there are some guidelines for that. What are those guidelines? Well, let's talk about them for just a few moments. Would you open your Bible to 1 Corinthians 16? I want you to see what the Scripture says about, about my giving and about yours. What does God command? 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, we see that we ought to give every week, and we see how much we ought to give. Not a dollar amount, but there's guidelines there. Look in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day, New American Standard, English Standard Versions, others will say, on the first day of every week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. You see, God's promised that he's going to take care of me and you. Seek first the kingdom of God, and God says all these things will be added unto you. With the excess and the abundance, as I've prospered, friend, I need to factor God into the equation as well. Give as we've been prospered. As God has blessed my life, and as God has blessed your life, I ought to give back to the work of saving souls and to the bring honor and glory to God uh, through the local congregation. We also see how often New Testament Christians were giving. There was a collection for the needy saints. We read about that in the book of Acts. We read about that in Romans. They were going to send money to help them with that effort. And so Paul says to the church in, in Corinth, as I've given orders to the churches in Galatia, so you must do also. What do you mean? On the first day of every week, that each will lay something aside. To help these Christians, they were to give on the first day of the week. And friend, when we look at their example, we see how the church gave in the first century. What a great example for us today. Christians give on the first day of the week to honor God and to help the Lord's church spread the gospel around the world. Now, let me back you up or actually move to the book of 2 Corinthians. And I want you to notice some other passages that teach us about giving. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I want you to look beginning in verse number 6. Paul says, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. 
Let, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. When I purpose in my heart, I purpose based on what the scriptures teach, but I also look at what I have, what I need to survive, the abundance and excess that God's give me, and I make a plan and a purpose. Uh, giving is not, okay, what, do I, what, what change do I have in my pocket? How many dollar bills do I have left in my wallet? What do I have today that I might could, out of the leftovers, give to God? That's not the idea. I make a, there's purpose, there's intent, and there is planning to giving. As I've been prospered, I purpose, I make a decision out of what God's blessed me with. When I look at my budget and my finances, when I look at what God has given to me and how much of an excess I have, out of that I purpose, I make a decision, an intent to give to God regularly out of that on the first day of the week. And so there's intent and there's purpose in our giving. And of course, here's the mentality. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. I'm not doing it grudgingly. Well, here comes the plate. I better give something. I'm not doing it out of necessity. If I don't give, I'm going to go to hell today. No, I'm not doing it because I have to. I'm not doing it grudgingly. Oh, I better give or people will look at me funny. No, I'm doing it because I want to. Why do I want to? Well, friend, I contemplate and I think about, and you do as well, how much God's given you. Just stop and think about it for a moment. How much has God blessed you with? Your family, your job, all your sins have been washed away if you've obeyed the gospel. You have every spiritual blessing in Christ. Your name is reserved on heaven's divine roll. You have the ability to overcome and defeat Satan. You can defeat any temptation the devil may throw your way. You've been given the word of God. You have a Christian family. I mean, the list could go on and on. Look at how much God has blessed me and you. And when I think about that, God doesn't have to force me. And I don't do it because if I don't, I'm going to go to hell. I can cheerfully give. I can, as it were, rejoice to give to God. And really, that's the motivation for giving. We give because our God has given so much to us. Remember James 1.17? Every good and perfect gift, where does it come from? from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no shadow or variation of turning. I'm motivated by how giving of a God we serve. I'm motivated by uh, the willingness of Jesus to give Himself as a sacrifice. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though He was rich. Yet for your sakes He became poor, that we through His poverty might be made rich. Look at how much God's given us. Look at how much Jesus gave up. And look at how much God has done to take care of each and every one of us. If I seek first the kingdom, God says all these things will be added unto you. And so we think about the purpose behind giving and the nature of it. Uh, we think about that it's a regular action that Christians should uh, indeed participate in. But we also realize that our attitude needs to be right when we give to God. The Bible says this. In Proverbs 23, verse 7, uh, the Scripture says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You're not what you eat, but you are what you think. What I, am, what I think, that's what I become. And friend, I need to have the right thought and the right attitude. I need to have the attitude of, of, of thankfulness. How thankful I am to God for everything He's done for me. And then I need to realize Here's a part of the attitude, and this is a verse that I hope you'll think about. Do you realize there's so much more to be gained in giving than there is in receiving? And that's so backward from the way many think today. We, we think that gaining is by getting and receiving and somebody giving us something. That's not true. There's so much more to be gained by giving than receiving. How do we know that? That's what Jesus said. Open your Bible or notice with me in Acts chapter 20. I want you to look at the words of Jesus that Paul recounts in Acts chapter 20, verse number 35. Acts chapter 20, Paul says this in verse number 35. The scripture records, Paul says, I've shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. Now notice, and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. 
when we give to God and give to the work of the church, what are we really giving to? We're giving to help save lost souls. We're giving to do good in our communities. We're giving so that the local congregation can spread the gospel, can open doors for evangelism, can glorify God by the teaching and the proclamation of His Word. What greater cause could you give to in all the world than the saving of lost souls? And again, please understand, we're talking about a Christian giving to the local congregation that he attends. We're not begging you for money, right? and that's not the idea. We're talking about worshiping God this way. And so I want you to just stop and think today. Think in your own life how much you've been blessed. Very likely the case that God has blessed you beyond measure. A family loves you dearly. A home, roof over your head. Very likely you live in a country that is richer than most countries in all the world. You probably have a car to drive, a job to go to. We have spiritual blessings beyond measure. The grace of God is available for all. Salvation is available. Every spiritual blessing can be found in Christ Jesus. Christian has the privilege of getting down on his hands and knees and praying, Father who art in heaven. We have brothers and sisters in Christ who will encourage us. We have the, the Bible, God's divine message, which is a, a perfect guide that will give us to heaven. When you stop and think about everything that God has given us, friend, it ought to motivate us to be a giving people. But we want you to know more than anything, God gave His Son so that we could have the hope of eternal life. Friend, we ask you today, do you believe in Jesus as the Son of God? John 8, verse 24. Would you be willing to turn from sin and turn to God and repent? Luke 13, 3. Would you confess the name of Jesus before men? Romans 10, verse 10. And would you do what Jesus said? Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Would you be immersed in water to be saved? If you've never obeyed the gospel, we encourage you to do that today. And may each of us, based on these ideas, worship God in spirit and in truth. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.